Hallelujah. Praise Yahuwah. Well, welcome to our Genesis 15 study. Um, last week, we had a great study on faith, um, service on faith, and actually Genesis 14, we were discussing about Abraham and um, basically the, how other nations confederate against him and his household. Um, and then we see how Abraham, he acted on faith. And we see how Abraham, how he trained his household, he took action to be able to defeat the other nations because you see King, Ch I have a problem saying his name, King Chad de Lamar, basically was able to um, capture Sodom and Gomorrah. And you see, he took his nephews and his nephew's household. So Abraham, we see, go back to Abraham, he was able to train his, his servants and to be able to defeat the other nation, the other kings, to be able to bring back his family, his household. And he acted on faith. So now in Genesis 15, we are going to see Abraham being obedient to the promise of Yahuwah. And then you see when Abraham chapter 14, Abraham first encounter was with Melchizedek, who was a prototype of Mashiach. And we see that example. And now we see the example of Abraham through obedience, the promises of Yahuwah. So we're going to start from Genesis 15. And whoever wants to read from Genesis 15, verse 1, from verse 1 to 5. Uh, Nathaniel. Go ahead, bro. Got it? Okay. Go ahead, there we go. All right. After these things, <clears throat> excuse me, after these events, the word of Yahuwah came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward is exceedingly great. And Abram said, Master Yahuwah, what would you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, See, you have given me no seed, and see, one is born of my house is my heir. And See, the word of Yahuwah came to him, saying, This one is not your heir, but he who comes from your own body is your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look now toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So are your seed. Hallelujah. Brother Nate, you see anything, Brother Nate? Okay, sorry about that. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I think Brother West, um, I, think, I, thought, I thought Brother West raised his hand, but okay. So now you see right now on verse, uh, from one to five, you see Abraham is receiving a, a vision from the Mosiah concerning the promise about how he's going to receive a blessing from his seed. So now Abraham, we all know about a vision. Vision is basically something that yeah, will appear, you know, he will basically give you an image or an understanding of something that's going to happen in the future. So then you see in verse, then you see in verse one, it says, after these, the word of Yah came saying, fear not Abraham, I am your shield. And you're seeing great rewards. So the most is telling Abraham, listen, I am your great reward. Trust in me. I'm going to bless you. So now Abraham to be the one to really follow through, through the blessing and the reward of Yahuwah. All right. Anyone have anything to share? Um, Brother Wes. Uh, Wes. Go ahead, Wes. Hey, can you hear me? You got it? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, sorry about that. The internet was a little bit weird for me there. Um, so I just wanted to make a, a, a comment about um basically verses two three and four and five where the father is now talking to abraham talking about his seed and then what does abraham go ahead and said and you see Ab abram uh 
you know, he's like, I, you have given me no seed. The only seed I have is my servant Eliezer, or the only seed I have is one born in my house. So you can already start seeing like this, a little bit of a, a little bit of concern that you see Abram having right now about the seed situation because he hasn't had any yet. But here's the father again, giving the promise. Um, but even though he gave the promise to Abram, we see a little bit later, uh, verse 16, 17, you start to see he, uh, he didn't have a hundred percent faith in that. He allowed his flesh to take exactly. control in that situation. But here you're starting to see the concern he's having. And then later you see that concern turning into a, a fruition because he didn't believe a hundred percent the words of Yahuwah. I agree. I agree exactly. I mean, so you see some type of doubt right there. Yeah. And we can all relate to Abraham, right? He's Abraham, even though he's not the father of all faith, you can see that he's still human. Like, yo, are you serious? I mean, I'm an old man right now. I'm going to have, you know what I'm saying? So he's like, wait a second. You talking about my servant Eliezer right now? The word Eliezer means God's help. We all know that Eliezer was a servant of Abraham, was helping his household. But this time, Yah is saying, not Eliezer. All right, I got somebody else for you. It's coming out of your loins. So he's basically questioning y'all, like, listen, I got this man, he's committed, he's a servant or whatever it is, but y'all said, I got something else. So you see, you're seeing the human nature of Abraham and the way he conducted himself when it comes to his faith at this moment, from a human I mean, point. Yeah, and you can definitely see that the father reassured him again exactly. of this promise. And then we didn't read verse six, but verse six then shows that he believed in that. But then again, it comes up in chapter 16. Exactly. Brother Rod. Yeah, so <clears throat> I like where, where both of you and Wes are going with um, just understanding that the, the reassurance was made clear and that, that Abraham wavered again. But I like how the, tr the transition from chapter 14 to verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 1, it says, after these things, <clears throat> the word of Yahuwah came to Abram in a vision saying, so not only does it show the different ways in which Yahuwah comes to us and speaks to us, but it always show it also shows with the after these things, a graduation to the next level of faith that will be needed. The next level of trust that Yahuwah is going to show Abraham or like uh, Wes said, um, reassurance that Yahuwah was going to show him. So he went through some things uh prior to chapter 15 and now it's the next level because as we know there's another level coming you know what i mean so it's a constant level of his faith being raised to the next so i thought that was a really good transition there yeah that's a great point and also um eliezer being his servant um in that time if you didn't have children your servant would be your heir you know, and the only way that would be null and voided is if you had a natural child. So it wasn't it wasn't just that he didn't have faith, but he also was going by tradition. Oh, well, you must be talking about Eleazar. This is my heir. So I uh, just wanted to point that out as well. And that's a good point is to show you how Yah, how he's above traditions. He's above making sure because a lot of times we like, man, you know, my family do this. We follow this tradition, but Yah is like, you know what? This is not about tradition. It's about my ways. I'm going to show you something greater than man's tradition. Because if you look at Eliezer, Eliezer was a slave. So we all know that the, the, the child could not come from, basically could not be a slave. It needed to come from some of, a, of a, someone that was basically free from that, from the physical aspect, but from a spiritual aspect of being free. So it was all about spiritual aspect of faith and understanding that I got something greater than the physical aspect of what I have in promise for you. Does that make sense? Um, verse, verse five, it says, and he brought him in forth abroad and said, look, look toward heaven and tell the stars that they be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thou see be. So now when we look at the stars, there's many stars in the skies. I mean, I have a bit of, to me, I think the stars is something different, but I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about that right now. But let's talk about this numerous, numerous stars in the skies. And Yah is saying, listen, I'm going to bless you as numerous as, the, sky, as the, sky, you know, the stars in the skies. So then you look at Romans chapter 418. Can somebody go to Romans chapter 418? 
If somebody could go there, Romans 4, 18. Let me know who's there. Go ahead, Wes. Yeah, uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 18. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it says, Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So this is the promise that Yah gave Abraham, and it was fulfilled that his nation, that is through his loan, through his seeds, many nations shall come, and many nations shall be blessed because of his seed. So how you see, those are, those are the promises that's being fulfilled at this moment through that scripture. Amen? Hallelujah. Um, anyone who wants to read from verse 6? Six, 6 to, um, let's say 6 to 11. Good, right. Okay, and he believed in Yah, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am Yahuwah who brought you out of Ur, of the <clears throat> Chaldeans, to give you this land to inherit. And he said to Yahuwah, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all of these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down, on on, on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. <clears throat> what you see, bro? <clears throat> well, there's quite a bit here. Um, he, you know, this this word uh, believed when it says, and and he believed, you know, we talked about the graduation and understanding of his faith level, right? So when it says here he believed, um, it means that he placed all trust in or he laid, it's like laying all your weight onto something and knowing that it's gonna hold you. That's what that word means. And you know, at that point, there was another level where that he trusted Yah. You know, whereas before it was questioned. But then he says in verse nine, in verse eight, how shall I know I will inherit it? And I don't think that it was so much that he didn't believe him as much as it was <clears throat> that he he just wanted to know how would he know what the promise was? How would I be able to see? In other words, how will I know to, to be able to identify it? What is the marker? What will I see that will let me know that this is it? Because, because the trust was not, he wasn't wavering in his trust at that point. So um, those are two things I saw. Um, there's some more stuff in 9, 10, and 11, but I'll let others talk. We'll come back to it. Thanks, bro. I mean, that makes sense, man. I mean, the reality is, is that, you know, we want to know. A lot of times as human beings, we want to know. You know, you might show us something, a promise. Abraham's like, listen, you're showing me this promise, but listen, where's the, where's the marker? I need to know for sure. And that's very, that's natural. That's, that's, that's understanding. That's, you know, that's very human because, you know what I'm saying? Because a lot of time we feel like, you know, we, we, you know, we may have faith, but where is, you know, how that faith, you know, can be shown. We need to see that. We need, we need to see the, the, the vision. We need to see what image, what you need to show us so that we can believe what it is. I mean, Yahuwah has given us the word. The word he has given us, the word. So through the words and the, and the great things he has done, we know that his word is true. We believe because we have seen the promises that he has done. So Abraham wants to see that promise. He wants to see that marker. 
So that's where we understand it. So then he was counted as righteous because he believed. So if you look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Trust in Yahuwah with all your heart, not on your understanding. So Abraham is giving his heart and trust to Yahuwah at this moment. He's like, you know what? I'm giving it to you. I'm trusting you. You're showing me the marker. You're showing me the way. I'm going to follow your ways. I'm going to follow your directions because I know that you are Yah. And that's why, to me, Proverbs chapter 3 is very key because it's the same way we need to be when trusting in Yahuwah with all our ways and need not on our understanding. Because I believe it was part of Abraham, too, that was like questioning, too. But yet, he totally, wholeheartedly gave it into Yah. Hallelujah. Anyone have anything to say? Yes, no. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> if nobody has anything to say, it's a whole lot more to say about verses 9, 10, and 11 um, because <clears throat> he is setting up this blood covenant here uh, and, and, splitting, spl and splitting them too. If we look at, at Jeremiah um, 34, Jeremiah 34, verse 18, it says, and I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant, which they made before me, when they cut the calf in two and pass between the parts of it, um, when they cut the calf in two and pass between the parts of it, the princes of Judah, the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf, I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. Their dead bodies who, who shall be for meat for the birds of the heavens and the beasts of all the earth. And I will give to Z Z Zedekiah, king of Judah and his princes into all their hand of their enemies, into the hand of those who seek their life. I'll stop there. But um, the imagery there with with the with the with the carcasses and the vultures coming down trying to get it, you know, is 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 shown in that in that passage I just read in Jeremiah, but it also shows the covenant of blood here. Um, but as we as we're gonna see, because if I don't know if you realize or not, but this these verses are used to say that now that you have to do this to have a covenant. There are people that believe that you have to do this when you get married to someone, you know? But as we're gonna find out, no, Yah is the one who makes the covenant. Abraham didn't have to do this. Abraham fell into a trance and Yah did it, just like he did with Yahusha, why? Because we couldn't do it. Exactly. They missed that point and they used this to say something that it does not say. So I just wanted to point that out. That's a good point. Wes had a question. Or yeah, Wes Wes. yeah, Wes. Wes? All right. I don't hear Wes right now, so. Go ahead, Brother Rick. Hello. Uh, you want to make me a co-host too? That way, I, I can come on here. But I had to step away to let that other one download. So uh, let me see. I the thing that I wanted to point out here when I when I was listening to you, Rod, is about the error. You know how how he how he basically told him or promised him that his his seed would be as numerous as the stars. And of course, there's no way of counting that. And I'm sure the sand's even as bad. But when you look at it, he said he believed Yahuwah and he counted it righteousness. Some people would say righteousness is actually doing something, you know, your your works, or whatever, it makes you righteous. This, all this says is that he believed what Yahuwah said and that he accounted it to him as righteousness. So that tells that goes in hand in hand with like with Yahusha. We gotta believe that Yahusha is Mashiach, that he's the, the son. 
you know, and and because of that belief, we declare what we that he's Mashiach, and that's when our salvation comes. So there's that faith and action there because of the belief in what Yahuwah promised. And then um, there was a couple other things in here that uh, that caught my attention as you were reading, and it was going back to that same place of the covenant where you were at, Rod. Um, because he, you know, when we look at it in the Sefer, where which has the left tabs in there, of course, these things are all the way through here, you know, the covenant symbol, the left tab. But in this particular line, the uh, 15 of verse 10, and he took a left tab unto him all these. So there was a covenant that he that he took as far as these uh, animals, uh, these these uh, pigeons and doves and and the goats and the rams. So he took them, which, as you said, was established a covenant, and we see that covenant symbol there. And then he divided them to to uh, basically cut them in half, so that, that and shed that blood, so that covenant could be made. But I find it interesting that he didn't divide the birds, and then right after that it, it is when the fowl or the birds came down upon the carcasses, and he had to drive them away. But it isn't it? And there's there's a left top just before the birds as well. So it's like, why did he, you know, why is that symbol there with the birds and he didn't divide the birds, right? And then it comes right before the fowl came down to try to devour the the the, the covenant offering. So there's there's a story within that story. It seems like there that uh, this kind of trying to reveal something. I think, but you know, I'm just kind of interested in your thoughts of what you see there with that. Well, the, from from what I understand, the passage I read in Jeremiah was talking about all of those that would be devoured that didn't keep the covenant. So the imagery, what I was relating the imagery to was the, the vultures coming down on the carcasses would represent devouring those that didn't keep the covenant because he's he's trying to show us that this cov this is a blood covenant and it's supposed to be kept. So, um, but Abraham stopped the vultures from eating. I don't know. Um, I don't know about the birds not being divided. Or, or, or could it be the opposite of what you just said with the birds breaking the covenant by trying to come down upon the carcass of the, of the offering. And that's why he didn't divide it or something to that effect. Maybe that's just something I'm throwing out there as a possibility. That's a good thought. That's a good thought for the red. But as you see Abraham right here, though, he's still, he's still following that trademark of blood covenant, which is very important. That's something that constantly remained from the beginning, and he's still following that trademark of the blood covenant, the sacrifice, making sure that he's making a covenant, you know, the covenant is being established between him and Yahuwah with these animals. So it's a good thing. Those are the things that he's following through. So right there, it shows his, his, his action. It shows about how he's following with faith what he needed to do to be able to establish that covenant. So yeah, he believed, but yet he followed through by making this blood covenant. So that shows right there that he's not only believing, but he's also showing obedience. Um, Brother Wes? Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. For some reason, the mic didn't unmute the last time. Yes. Um, but uh, I just wanted to make a comment on 9, 10, and 11. Uh, to understand 9, 10, 11, I think adding in the next few verses, because it's actually showing uh, his seed and the inheritance of what's going to happen in the future. Because uh, 9, 10, 11, um, I see it as uh, he's, you know, he cuts them up and he divides them. I know it divides. So you have the fowls coming. And whenever a fowl comes, the fowl, fowl is used, usually doing mischief. Uh, we, we know that the Messiah used the fowl who come and takes the seeds away, the seeds so they're not planted into the ground. Um, and then literally the next couple of verses, it talks about, you know, his, uh, his seed going through 400 years of slavery and then having to come out and stuff like that. So I think combining them together will give us a better understanding of nine, 10 and 11. Thanks brother Wes. Um, let's move on. Verse 12. Let's finish it off from verse 12 to 21.
Anybody would like to read from verse 12 to 21? Yes, nobody, so I'll read. Um, Wes. Go ahead, Wes. Yeah, um, starting verse 12, or no, starting verse 11, right? Not 12. 12, and it says, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the, fourth, in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark. Behold, a, smoke for, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In that same day, Yahuwah made a covenant with Abram, saying unto thy seed, have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river of Euphrates, the Kenites Ken, uh, Ken, the and the Ken, Kenazites and the Camonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the, Rif, and the Rifiam, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. A lot of ites, huh? Israelite. Uh-huh. For the West? Um, I just, I mean, the next following verse is kind of exp- shows, now this is the entire covenant taking place because the covenant comes in uh, towards the end where he makes a covenant with, uh, with the Father. Uh, and he's explaining the hand, uh, the land, his seed, and his inheritance. And I mean, it shows prophecy here for the 400 years of slavery and saying that they will come again to this land that I've already showed you. Because uh, it always bothered me um, where I think it was verse seven where you know, the father is telling him, this is the land that I've given to you. And then all of a sudden the next verse, he's like, w- uh, when will I inherit it? So uh I think he was more asking for like, when would my seed inherit this? Because he didn't have any seed at that time. That's right. Hey, Rock. Yeah, I, I think I found the answer to Rick's question about why the birds weren't split in half. Leviticus uh, chapter one. Um, I'll just read uh, a couple verses. And if the burnt sacrifice of his offering to Yahuwah is of birds, then he shall bring the offering of turtle doves or young pigeons. The priest shall bring it to the altar, wring off its head and burn it on the altar. Its blood shall be drained out at the side of the altar and he shall remove its crop with its feathers and cast it beside the altar on the east side into the place for ashes. Then he shall split it at its wings, but shall not divide it completely. And the priest shall burn it on the altar, on the wood that it is on the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to Yahuwah. So it wasn't supposed to be split. It was only split the way he said do it at its wings. So there we go. Abraham knew how to do it. Hallelujah. In Leviticus. <laughs> you gotta go to the Torah. Um, praise Yah, bro. So now, you know, verse 12 to me is interesting. Verse 12, it says, When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. So the way it sounds like, you know, Abraham had this like uh, uh, a bad, you know, uh, horrific, um, how you said, understanding of what was gonna happen to his people. He was like, man, this is what's going to happen to my people. He sounded like he had a, like a bad nightmare. It was like, man. So he's seeing a vision of what's going to happen to his people. Because if you look at verse 13, and he said unto Abraham, Know a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. So Abraham was able to see all these things that has been shown by Yah, the affliction of his people Israel. So he's like, that was troubling him in a dream. It was very troublesome. Right? So now... If we continue on, it said, Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age, 
but in a fourth generation that should come either again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In verse 17, and it came to pass that the sun went down and it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp and passed between these, those pieces. So right there you see how Abraham is like, you know, he's, I don't know what's the word for it, but he's like, how you said, um, he's seeing the affliction of the people, right? But then it's, it's troubling him of what's going to happen to his people, but yet he's like, you know what? That's going to happen, but yet I got to make sure that I fulfill this promise. I got to make sure that I'm establishing my faith and seeing that, yeah, my people is going to go through this, but I got to be the example of my, you know, the father of faith through all this. So, um, and then if you look at when it comes to, in verse 19, the 10 nations that the Israelites had to, had to basically fight against all these 10 nations, you know, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, and Genesis chapter, um, chapter two talks about how Israel is gonna establish all these lands, right? David was able to fight all these people, all these nations, but yet he was not able to conquer all these people. But in the future, that's gonna be able to be established. So Abraham is gonna be, his, his children, his seed is gonna be established all these lands of the enemies from the Euphrates to the, to the land of Egypt. That's a big chunk of land, 10 nations. At this moment, Israel is not completely established as a whole, whole empire or, or the nation that it was supposed to establish that Yahuwah is trying to promise his people. I don't know if you see that. Because, I mean, because if you look at Euphrates, it's all the way in Iraq, and you look at, um, I think um, in the book of Genesis chapter 1, it talks about, uh, what is it? Um, Genesis chapter 1, no, chapter 2, verse 11. Let me go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 11. The name of the first, it says in verse 10, let me start from verse 10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from then it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is with compass the whole land of Avila, where there is gold. And the gold of the land is good. There is Bedelium and an onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is the compass of the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Ikadel, that is which go through the east of Assyria and the fourth river of Euphrates. So Yah is basically establishing that this is the promise that Israel will be having in the future. Brother West. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to, uh, I forgot to mention verse 17. Um, because, uh, again, this is talking about what's happening to his people in Egypt. And 17 is it going a little bit deeper when it says, and it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Now, the pieces is referring to is the pieces in verse uh, 9, 10, 11 um, previously. So that's why 9, 10, 11 is connected to this vision or this dream that he's having uh, of future uh, things that's going to happen. And the reason why... Uh, I bring up 17 is because I believe um, I have it here in Deuteronomy. Yeah, in Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 20 says, But Yahuwah have taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. So uh, the furnace that he's referring to, I'm connecting it with talking about that's the slavery or that affliction that they're going through. And the other piece is talking about a burning lamp. Uh, which I wasn't able to find uh, a solid verse for that, but I'm associating the burning lamp with, with uh, you know, being a follower of the Father, or being a child, um, or being the light of the world type thing. So it's showing that they will pass between those pieces, and if those pieces that he offered is talking about his seed, his generation, uh, then you know, truth and the fire, the affliction will pass between those pieces. I don't know if anyone else sees that. Yeah, right. Yeah, I would say um, the darkness, you know, because anytime Yah's judgment comes, it, it, it's preceded by a darkness. You know, even when Yahusha, it got dark in the middle of the day when he was on the stake, right? But then the light representing 
that which Yahoo is going to guide you through. So all of that image um, is consistent throughout scripture. Um, and, you know, Genesis being the foundation, uh, you see it originate here as well. well I actually found, uh, I actually found a verse for the burning lamp and that's actually, uh, Isaiah 62, verse 1, where it says, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. Right. So that will be the preceding light that Yahuwah leads you, God. Yeah. That's right. So it's like the pieces that he's used in 9, 10, 11 is referring to his, his seed, and, and then what they're going to go through, the affliction of the f smoking furnace, and then... Uh, this affliction and also this this light, this righteousness will pass between them. Absolutely. And praise Yah. And Abraham was the foundation of the father of faith. To me, he was that he was that light. He was that lamp that represent that example of, of what's to come for, the, for our children, for the children ahead in the future. He needed to represent that. To me, I see Abraham as that lamp, as that light that he needed to for us to be standing on because he's the father of our faith through that example of um, the afflictions that he went through also as a father. Does that make sense? Let me see. Hallelujah. So that's Genesis chapter 15. Does anybody, have any, have any, anybody have any thoughts about um, when it comes to the promise from Euphrates to um, to Egypt. Anybody anybody have any thought about that? Well, I think it would have been this. This would have been very encouraging to the Israelites because basically all of those people were going to be removed in order for that land to be theirs. You know what I mean? So, was it daunting on them to see all of these people and all of these enemies there? You know and know that Yah was going to be the one to remove them so that that could be their land. Um, I do see that. So is the land established right now at this moment? Concerning the promise? Is it what? Is the land that was promised to Abram, is it established right now at this moment? Concerning this passage? I don't think so. All right. So it's not. It's not established. All right. So this is something. So that was rhetorical. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm just asking because, because many, you know, because at this time, many people believe that Atlanta is established right now, right now, today. Right. But it's really not. So it's something that is a promise that is going to come in the new Jerusalem. He's going to go back and bring back what was in the beginning from the Garden of Eden, which I believe is the entire promise that's gonna be given to the people of the Israelites. From the Euphrates to the Nile in Egypt. And that's about 10 nations. And these 10 nations were not, were not completely destroyed. Um, <coughs> Yah used David to destroy these nations, but it was not completely destroyed. So at this moment, we're still waiting for that promise. Hallelujah. So this is Genesis 15 study. Praise Yah. Hallelujah. 